Somebody said to me years ago that the picture we hang in the frame of our minds is what we are. So if we, if we can visualise it and we believe we can do it, then we can do it. If we have the passion and the energy to go with that, and most entrepreneurs have, that's why they're successful. The Architects of Business on Joe, in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year programme, telling the inspirational stories behind Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. Hello and welcome back to the Architects of Business on Joe, made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year, where we hear the inspirational stories of some of Ireland's most successful entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Sonia Lennon, and in this episode, I'll be speaking with David Walsh, founder and CEO of security monitoring company Netwatch. Founded in 2003 in Carlo, it brought groundbreaking technology into the Irish market. And since then, David has grown the company to become a global phenomenon in crime prevention. David Walsh, thank you so much for joining us uh, with Architects of Business. It's a pleasure to have you. I've heard you speak before. Um, I don't think we're going to be short of words from mm. either side of the couch here. Um, Hopefully not. <laughs> I know we're not. First of all, give us the elevator pitch. I'm not sure what floor we're going to yet, but yeah. give us the elevator pitch for Netwatch. Well, Netwatch is a Carlo company and we specialise in remote video surveillance. What that means in very simple English is that from our communication hub in Carlo, we've got a link to our clients' security cameras all over the world. And we've developed very intelligent software that sits behind those cameras, analysing the view of the camera for what's deemed to be unacceptable behaviour, abnormal behaviour, criminal behaviour. If it's criminal behaviour taking place, well then we can intervene there and then to stop a crime taking place. For instance, intervention specialists in our hub in Carlo can challenge an intruder in New York by giving them a personalised audio warning. You in the red jacket, you in the blue hat, whatever happens to be the case, and clearing them from the site. The whole principle behind the Netwatch system is crime prevention, because we can detect intruders before they reach their intended target, then we're in a position to stop the crime taking place. So it's a perfect marriage between technology and humans. From day one, we position Netwatch as a technology company because we were bringing this innovative, disruptive technology to a very conservative industry back in 2002, 2003. But we were well aware from day one that it was the customer service element of our service that our customers really liked and depended on. So how many countries are you servicing right now? Well, presently, it's, it's amazing, actually. We started Netwatch uh, on a small warehouse in Carlo with eight cameras. Can I just ask you, do you get 20 quid every time you say Carlo? More than that. <laughs> <laughs> but we are on that point. We are very proud to be from Carlo because we've done something. We've built a global organisation outside of the big, the big capital in Carlo. We're very proud of that fact, uh, and most of the, in, the individuals working in our organisation are from Carlo. But we started in Carlo with a, an eight camera system and a on a warehouse in Carlo, uh, and we had three employees in the organisation. Today we have five hundred and sixty employees Amazing. in that watch. We monitor uh, over eighty thousand cameras on sites, on a quarter of a million sites across four continents. That is so phenomenal. It's a, it's and how many people journey. would be in that monitoring hub at any one time? In the communication hub at night time, there's probably about 20 people because the technology is doing all the filtering from all the cameras we have around the world. Albeit that we have 80,000 cameras out on the edge, as we call it in the customer site, that the technology is so intelligent that it filters out nuisance activity, false alarms, uh, animals, plants, whatever happens to be the case in clement weather conditions. So only real events are presented to our intervention specialists. So what it means, we all have competitors now, we didn't mm -hmm. have back in the day. But because of our investment in technology, it means that we can respond faster to an incident happening at a customer site than any of our competitors across the globe. And that Beautiful. gives us an advantage. Beautiful. So let's talk about, um, I suppose, little David, back to the beginning and, and your upbringing. I think it's... Um, it's always interesting to see, we, we know where you are now because you've just yeah. told us um, and it's phenomenal. Where did it begin? I'm often asked the question actually, how do we turn out in life? Is it genetics or is it uh, the environment we're brought up in? And I think it's a com combination of both. I grew up in Kerry on a family farm. There was 11 of us in a traditional farm cottage and genuinely we thought we were the luckiest people on the planet. And the reason for that was because our mother, and particularly our mother and our dad, drilled into us the, the importance of positive attitude in life. And in terms of trying to achieve something in life, you need to have a positive attitude. My mother in particular was way before her time. She was really big into visualisation. She used to say to us, we were very, very small. Irrespective of what you want to do, just visualise it. Dream about it first. And then most importantly, take positive action to make it happen. Mm 
She and really, because this is such a big topic now. Absolutely. Um, and and it's it's being proven as as you know a major element in success. Being able to see where you're going will help you to build a path together. She's a major pioneer in that case. Absolutely. She was way before her time, and this is going back. And she knew a lot of things. She knew even back 50, 60 years ago, and she saw it in her own family. Those who got a really good education did well in life. Those who could combine that education with the vision and the passion and the energy to do certain things. For instance, we were and the hard work. Of course. And hard work is critically important. But growing up in Kerry, we dreamed about playing football for Kerry, right? And of the eight kids, six of us played football for Kerry at some level. My own twin sister won Sierra Island, Island, Island Middles for Kerry. That's so we had that environment. And then my father would join his tuppence worth into the, into the scenario. And he'd turn around and say, look, whatever you do, avoid negative, pessimistic people. They will drag you down. Energy vampires, he used to call them, that they would suck the energy out of a good idea. And we were to avoid him at all costs, and it was very funny. He used to save his famous joke until Christmas Day. He'd always say to us around the Christmas table, the only thing you should ever take from a negative, pessimistic person was a loan. Because he'd, he'd joke and say they'd never expect it back. So That's that was, hilarious. So that was, that was the ethos that we had. And, and coupled with, as you say, that hard working environment on a family farm. Every, there's no hiding place on a family farm. Eight so 11 kids. people living in yeah. that environment. That's like a small company. Well, it was 11 kids, uh, eight, eight kids, my mum and dad and my grandmother, all in this little farm cottage. So everybody had to put their shoulder to the wheel. Yeah. Hard work was the order of the day. We knew, we knew it else. We used to get up at six o'clock in the morning, work all day on the farm, go to the bed half nine, ten o'clock at night. And that was the norm. And working hard was, was just part of what we were about. And it was part of, and, you know, in later life, you bring these sort of things with you. And we, I think we are most definitely shaped by the environment in which we grew up. So would you have considered your dad, and you rarely hear these two words, I suppose, but would you have considered your dad a businessman? Is that, was there business in there? No question about it. And even down to growing and scaling and things, because we had this family farm and then he, he rented out land around our farm at home to, to grow and expand. And that was his mentality. And, and, and like when we grew up in Kerry, he, was, he kept talking about uh, around the kitchen table. And I think this shapes our view in life as well. The discussion around the kitchen table was often, very often, about successful business people. Interesting. Be, be it nationally or locally. And particularly at that time in the early 70s, the Kerry group was taken off. And he kept ranting and raving about this wonderful company that started in the stall. He had met Dennis Brosnan as a young man. He said, this guy is going to make this thing big. And so this, this for us was a natural thinking into our mindset that, that being in business was good for starters. And certainly growing a business was critically important too. And it's back to that piece of if you can't see it, you can't be it. If you're, yeah, exactly. if you're exposed to that level of, of success, that becomes more normalised to you, I suppose. It becomes the norm. And, and I think somebody said to me years ago that the picture we hang in the frame of our minds is what we are. So I love if, we, it. if we can visualise it and we believe we can do it, then we can do it. If we have the passion and the energy to go with that, and most entrepreneurs have, that's why they're successful. Absolutely. The ability to execute. Yes. So let's, so uh, Agri was in your blood, mm -hmm. in your DNA, in everything that you knew. So um, your decision when you left school to go to further education was also in that area. It was. I went to boarding school in Watford. Did you? In De La Salle in Watford from Kerry. That was a tradition in my family. Again, my mother understood the, the, the value of education and back then having been boarding then you had to concentrate on what you were doing. Mm -hmm. You couldn't be sidetracked by stuff that was happening on the farm. No distractions. So after we finished uh, the Leaving Cert, I went on to study agriculture science in UCD. Okay. And that's what brought me to Carlow. Uh, I applied for a job, this is 1988, applied for a job and I saw this organisation called Keenan's, which was an amazing company, a Carlow company, based in South Carlow in a place called Boris, just underneath the, the Mount Linster mountain. Uh, and here was an organisation that was involved in livestock feeding systems. And they were doing it globally. And they were changing the world globally. They were changing the world for farmers. My intention day one when I would join Keenan's was to get six months uh, experience in Keenan's, go back to Kerry and do something in Kerry. And when you have no experience, you think six months is a lot. But of course, we now know nothing. it's nothing, right? So I went into Keenan's and I just got sucked into this organisation that was changing the world from the bottom of Mount Linster Mountain in a small little village called Burris. Uh, and Gerard Keenan was the CEO of the company. He was the, they call, his, his dad had started the company. He was the CEO. And he had this, again, he had this fantastic vision uh, uh, about taking over the world and doing the right thing for farmers. Because farmers, were, were when they used uh, the, the Keenan feeder to manufacture uh, forage and stuff for, for feed for livestock, mm -hmm. they were saving a fortune above and beyond buying it off the shelf. And, uh, and they were healthier animals because of it, because of the way it was mixed and fed and stuff like this. And Joe had this great vision, right? And, and he, was, he was an amazing leader. And I'm often asked who, who influenced me mm. in my 
business life. And of course, we have the big guns like with the, the Richard Bransons and these guys that we all look up to, Dennis Brosnan mm -hmm. from the Kerry Group. But, uh, but at, a, at, a, at a personal level, at a micro level, Jerk Heenan was an amazing man and he had, his, his natural leadership style was to build the capabilities of those around him. Like it was from Jerk Heenan that I learned about strategic positioning, strategic alignment, innovation uh, and customer service as a real competitive advantage in an organisation. So I often say this, I went into Keenan's as, as green as you like and I left 14 years later with a toolbox of business tools that allowed myself and I, Kelly, to set up Netwatch and drive the business it is today. But it certainly, that, that, that lack of fear of going international Yes. Right, was, was well, it was normalised to you, back to the it same It was normalised, it, it really was. And to be able to do something on an international stage from a small place like Carlo, then that, that, that there's a, a, a humongous fulfilment in that in yeah. itself. Amazing. So, obviously, you could have stayed in Keenan's forever. Mm -hmm. you, you could have made your way to the top as part of a succession plan, mm -hmm. but... Um, Something happened. Yeah. Some well, some epiphany happened. After fourteen years in Keenan's, I was at the top table. I was the managing director of the Irish marketplace for them. It was a family company. Jerk Keenan was probably in his mid fifties at the time, so he had no intention of of moving on, and, and rightly so, because he was contributing enormously to the organisation. So I was looking at different ways uh, of doing something for myself. Mm. And then the startup of Netwatch came our way because actually what happened was we were out for a meal one night. Niall Kelly, uh, his wife Esther, Beatrice, my wife, and another couple. And our friend was uh, relaying to us a story of a personal incident that happened to him the week before. He was the key holder in his uh, local business for the traditional intruder alarm. He got a phone call at three o'clock in the morning to say the alarm had been activated. He assumed it was a false alarm because the site had a serious history of false alarms. Okay. Right. So he raced out to the site just to put in the code to stop the bells and whistles going sure. off because the neighbours were always given out. But unfortunately, it was a real event taking place, a break-in taking place. He was attacked, there was three guys there, and he was hospitalised. Uh, and when Niall and I heard the story, we said, look, there has to be a better way of doing things. There has to be a better way of protecting the property, the assets, but most importantly, protecting the first responders, like our friend. And it was there from then on that we, the, the seed was so. Niall Kelly's background is in uh, electronic engineering and uh, electronics. He was familiar, this, bear in mind, this was 2002. Mm -hmm. So we have no Wi-Fi, we have no broadband. We'd, in, in terms of the space that we're in now, there's no digital recording. It was all VHS tapes that just stuck in and out. Wow. And, and people had to change them every day. It's hard to believe now, right? But, so, but now he was familiar with that. He had, he had read an article about video transmission technology, predominantly for military installations in, 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 in Australia. So we discovered a company in Australia that was developing transmission boxes. So you could, and the, our idea there, one, right, was that if you did get an alarm call, Mm -hmm. like our friend, right, you got the phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, then rather being a lamp to the slaughter, you could log on to your cameras just to make sure the coast was clear. That was what we were thinking first. But once we got in contact with this company in Australia, they said, well, you can, you can do it in reverse. So you have a restricted area and you don't want anybody entering that area. And once they do, it will send you back then a snapshot, a photograph. So you're absolutely certain there's somebody there. There's no more false alarms. One of the big problems with the intruder alarm business, and we started 17 years ago back then, and also today, is the level of false alarms that's generated. 97% are thereabouts across the globe of traditional intruder alarms or false alarms, right, so. Which leads to a mindset. It leads to a mindset, like our friend, you know, wasn't thinking when he went out to the site. But to be fair to the police forces around the globe, like, they're not going to respond because they have their job to do too. Here's commercial properties that are remotely monitored by intruder alarms. 97 times out of 100, it's a false alarm. For, for the 3% the that's real events, well, they're probably gone by the time you get there anyway, so it's very difficult to do. So we just felt that we could, by developing the network system, we could take all the boxes from that perspective. But most importantly, from our perspective, and this is the ethos in, of the company and the, the, the culture of the company and the mission statement, if you like, we have. When our friend reached out to the monitoring centre afterwards when he got out of hospital to give out, they said, well, it's not our fault. The protocol said if the alarm would have to ring you. His point was, well, if it wasn't so many false alarms, I wouldn't have been a lamb to the slaughter. I wouldn't have gone out there. I said, well, then you need to speak to your installer. So he spoke to his installer said, well, I installed the, the detection system absolutely correctly, as exactly by the manufacturer's guidelines. He spoke to the manufacturer who happened to be out of the country. So the only person to lose out in the entire supply chain... Is the client. ...was the person who paid for the entire supply chain. So we said, look, OK, we can develop this network system. We will tick the boxes from a security perspective, but, but we'll also make sure that the customer is always centre stage. And every single decision that we make in that watch today, 17 years later, with a quarter of a million customers, is that the customer is always number one. And that's our objective. And it's driven in, in terms of the ethos of the company and the, the culture of the company. Everybody knows in that watch. 
at every single level that when somebody installs a netwatch system, they're putting their business, their livelihoods, often their loved ones, in our care. We have a moral obligation to make sure we deliver our promises. We don't oversell, we deliver our promises. So when you combine that, then with a very aggressive growth strategy, the combination is good. That's amazing. And so let's just go back a little tiny bit into the, the moment when, when, when the epiphany came and you mm -hmm. realised this is, this is our, yeah. um, <coughs> our, this vision. Is our vision. Yeah, this is what we're going to we do. We went to Australia now and, now and we met the company that manufactured the transmission boxes. And then it became obvious, as I said, that you could send the footage back to us when somebody into the restricted area. But as we were leaving the room in Australia, in Melbourne, the guy says, you know, you can actually include audio warnings here. You can have challenge in the intruder. I was going to ask right? you about that. When so, did that drop yeah, into the th mix? This was, this was coming back uh, in the very first meeting we had, just leaving the meeting, right? And the guy said to us, look, we love your passion, we love your energy. What we'll do for you guys, if you want, we can, cost, we can uh, 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 develop the box further for commercial premises as opposed to military installations and stuff like that. And it, this is what he said. We could include an audio warning, an audio challenge. You can actually challenge that person with a personalised audio warning. And that was it. Like we, before we got on the plane, coming home, I said to Niall, let's I'm packing in my job. And so did Niall. And we started off. And, but in the, 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 the early days were very funny because we didn't have... You see, the funny enough, so I'm in Keenan's, so I'm selling to farmers. Niall had left Keenan's at that stage. He was in Keenan's with me, and now he's working with a golf course construction company. Neither of which would be big markets for, for the Netwatch system. So, so from, what was your pipeline? So from zero. So from day one, we just started knocking on doors. Picked up the phone, traditional selling, explained what we were doing. Everybody thought it was a great idea, but nobody was going to buy it. And then all of a sudden, and I'll never forget this, in November 2002, I spoke to a company, this warehouse in Carla, and the guy said to me, he said, we're closing up for Christmas. He said, right, will you promise me, promise me, you'll come to me in January. And I said, promise you? <laughs> so we went to him in January, and the rest of history was our first sight. And then once we got one, we got two, we got three, we got a hundred, we got, and now we have a quarter of a million. You had your proof point. Yeah. David, hold that thought. I can't wait to hear the rest. We're going to take a quick break. The Architects of Business on Joe, in partnership with the EY Entrepreneur of the Year programme. What I love about your story is that you had this brilliant idea that was, you know, gifted to you. You had the resources, you had the background. You started with a global vision. Our motivation from day one was to build this global organisation. After leaving Keenan's, we knew this was possible. It wasn't afraid for us. And again, putting things in context, we rose from the ashes of the demise of three fantastic organisations, Braun, Sugar Company and Lapple. These between them employed 3,500 people in Cairo out of a working population in the entire county of 15,000 people. Wow. So our motivation was not to make big revenues or big profits. In my view, actually, that should never be the motion, motivation of a startup. That should be the result. The result of doing the right thing and doing those things better than anybody else in the world. And that was our motivation. But we wanted to build this organisation in Cairo, build this global organisation, and play our part in filling the void left by those three, those three great organisations, who between them, contributed 150 years to the fabric of Carla society. Wow. Put a lot of kids through school, through university, and so on and so forth. And that was our big motivation. So to this day, you asked me at the start of the interview why I'm so proud to be from Carla, because that from day one, that was our motivation to do that. And I think when you set your motivation as something more lofty than making money. Within purpose. You, purpose. Then you can get people around you. And, and, and what we've discovered over the years that when you, when you do surround yourself with people who truly believe in the vision, who truly believe in the ambition and have the passion for the company, then a very strange thing happens, right? That trust breaks out in the organisation because everybody's fighting for the same cause. And when trust breaks out in an organisation, people come to work for what they can give, not Amazing. just for what they can get. You see, in reality, they're coming to work for themselves because they are responding to a higher power. They're responding to a set of values, a set of beliefs, a sense of belonging, of place. And when people come to work under those conditions, we everything's serious, easy, right? We have a serious competitive advantage. It's never easy, but we, but it, relatively speaking, absolutely, we can defeat anybody. And that's why, when you, when, when we were making big decisions in Netwatch back, I remember back, clearly back in two thousand and eight, at the start of the recession, brought all the staff together for the very first time. We started two thousand and three. Five years later, January two thousand and eight, brought everybody together for the very first time. And uh, this was the start of the recession, and we knew things. How many happen. people were in the team at, at that, that stage? Day. We only had forty-five people wow. in the company. I remember it clearly in the Seven Oaks Hotel in Carlow. And you know, and we, and we outlined another hundred quid there. We outlined what we felt was, <laughs> was only twenty. We, we only we outlined what we felt was coming down the tracks with the people and said, "Look, guys, there's a big change happening." Now we didn't predict the, the, the financial disaster, but we knew things were changing, in the, because of our own customers and stuff like this. And we outlined to our to our uh, staff at the time that we had two options: we could wrap our arms around what we'd previously achieved, right, and hope that we'd be around when the economic storm blew over, or 
we could go on a really aggressive investment strategy. Invest in a brand new hub, which we did, invest in international markets, i.e. the States, invest, build a brand new uh, uh, R&D department in Netwatch. When all our competitors were stripping down their R&D departments, we built ours. We call it Netwatch Visual Labs. Today we have 20 software engineers in it, and, and the outcome of that is a suite of software solutions. That's the envy of our competitors across the globe. You must have been, you must have been uh, pr pretty cash rich at that point to be able to make that decision. Well, funny enough, right? So from, from the, we were, in the early days, we were of the belief, and it's still probably true, that the best way to finance a company is through gross margin. Amen. Amen. Now, by getting in, so, so doing things right, pricing it properly, and making sure that, that, that we deliver it, uh, fulfill it within the, the, the budget, and making sure we get paid. So we did have a very strong balance sheet by de December 2007. And I actually, just to, to cut across you there, I think that's something that is um, missed a lot from is, yeah. entrepreneurs, that they, you know, it's the, the, the chase for, for external funding. It has become so normalised, yeah. whereas actually a, 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 a car selling apples that you end up with a, a good margin well, on, that, that's more important. I think, I think it goes back to the farming start off, right? Because you don't want to lose the farm, right? No. And, you know, absolutely. That's like. the home. And, 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 and I've never seen my father sell a land to buy new cows. That never happened either, right? So, so he built, he built on, and he he, he was very, he was am ambitious, as we said around and scaling. But he did it in a manner that he could control it financially. But there comes a time in a business, of course, when then you need to go for exponential growth, and you do need external capital, yeah. and it has a huge role to play. But going back to January two thousand and eight, so we, we and the last thing we said to our, we, we agreed at that meeting to be different in the marketplace, which you have to be, yeah. right? We decided in the early days, we were like other organizations, we would sell equipment to a client, CapEx, and then charge them a fee for our monitoring services. Yeah. And one of our staff, actually the receptionist, Alison, turned around and said, if we are as good as we say, why don't we give away the equipment free? Amazing. And let's charge them for the relationship over a five-year contract. And that's what we did. We shifted in the middle of the recession, where in the middle of the credit crunch. The model shifted. changed. The model changed completely from a capex to an apex. Now, it was all onerous on us because then we had to pay for the equipment up front, but we had the strong balance sheet. But we give everybody in the room the opportunity to be part of this journey or not. And I said to the staff at the time, look, this is a risky thing. We're betting the company. My belief is that we're going to be successful. We may not be successful. You have to make a decision because of your family and what you're trying to achieve with your family, whether you want to send someone to third level, you want to extend the house, you need to make those decisions on your basis and the level of risk that you're prepared to take. Three people left the organisation, we said to them, and we organised it over an orderly period of time. Yep. So look, okay, over a three-month period, we will get a job for you externally and we get someone to replace you internally, and that's what happened. But that was the, the, the eureka moment for us when it came to people. We realised that, realised that day. That Everybody has a role to play. And most importantly, the recruitment department is the most important department in an organisation. Because if you want to deliver a really high quality service, then you need to have motivated employees. The best way to have motivated employees is to employ motivated employees. People who are naturally, and this is going back to me, parents again, people who are naturally, have that natural positive disposition in life themselves. So every single person to this day who, gives, who applies to Netwatch and we get to the final stages, we do personality profiles. We're looking for three things. One, to make sure they have a natural uh, uh, positive disposition in life. Two, that they take ownership of events. And three, that they're capable of change. Lovely. Because change must be... A big part of who you are as a company. Well, we're an innovative company in many senses, right? Particularly from a technology perspective. But we look at innovation with, in, in a far broader, holistic sense than just people in white coats or software engineers. We're looking at our entire business in terms of how we present it to the outside world. So it's absolutely critically important. And, and our our philosophy around innovation is driven by the belief that there are only two types of organisations in the world: those that are drivers of change, and those that are victims of change. And unfortunately. Those who are victims of change will not survive. Mm -hmm. They have a stay of execution, whether it's six months, six years, whatever happens to the case. And, and the formula to decide which bucket we're in, whether we're drivers or victims, is very simple too. If the rate of change in the marketplace is faster than the rate of change in our organisations, then by... You're on a downward spiral. On a, so we were always going to be innovators. We're always going to invest heavily in every aspect of our business. As I said earlier on, we invested heavily in technology and we have some extraordinary te technology now. So much so that our competitors come to us to see if we'll outsource it to them, license it, we won't do that. It's our, it's our secret sauce. It's our value proposition. But that, has been, that, that philosophy has been fundamental in part across all aspects of the business. Amazing. And so when, just going back, because just something's occurred to me, when, when you took in the original technology that was under their 
IP, yeah. was it? Correct. That was off the shelf stuff. Okay. Now, at the time, we, we wrapped it in a really good, and, this, and I'm sure an awful lot of entrepreneurs like this, we wrapped it in a really, really good uh, customer service. We yeah. really did. That was paramount from day one, right? But equally, we were very astute in terms of PR and marketing, in terms of how we positioned it. Yes, we positioned it, watch day one, as a technology company, right? Which we were to a degree, right? But it wasn't our technology. And as, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people listening will agree with this, there comes a time, right, when you have to, you either stop saying it, or you start doing it, yeah. right? You can say you're a technology company for so long, right? But then the market will not, will, will, will not forgive you if you don't go off and do it. It needs that authenticity. It does, right? So then when we invested in our R&D department, it just sat so comfortably for us to do that because we wanted it to be different. We wanted to set up Netwatch to go to the United States. We believed that we needed to have better technology. We needed the, the new business model and talent, the managed service offering. So that's where it came from, and we drove it on from there. And it's been, look, it was a risk. There was no guarantee that that huge investment, which back in 2008 was a million euros, which is huge money in the height of a recession, right? There was no guarantee we'd get return, but we got return 20-fold. And the, the strategy for growth then in terms of um, the mergers and acquisitions, Yeah. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Well, I think every company goes on a, their, their journey evolves over time from the very early days. And if you look at the early days, Netwatch, it genuinely was all about building credibility for the Netwatch system. We were bringing this disruptive technology to a very conservative industry. The security industry is incredibly uh, conservative. So that piece was part of it. And then we start looking at international markets and, and growing, and, and we had a direct selling te sales team in Ireland. Then we went to the UK with the direct sales team there. But from day one, the United States was always on our mind. Absolutely always on our mind. We used to joke myself and Nile in the early days when we were leaving the island of Ireland, we'd go west as opposed to east. Yeah. We'd go to the United States as opposed to the Need UK. Need to be the Beatles. But we, absolutely, but we felt as well, right, because we were big into culture and we felt that our culture as an organisation was more aligned to the natural culture of the USA, albeit the USA is a huge country now, right, in terms of customer service and so on and so forth. So that was a big driver for us. So, so we evolved and when we went to the States, we, we started again, it was like starting back in Ireland. Now, we had 12 years of experience in Ireland, so it was a lot easier to do that. But the right? proof points weren't necessarily valid over Absolutely. there. Absolutely. So we had to reprove it again, and we ended up deliberately having a direct selling strategy over there to get iconic customers. Very, very fortunate that the former Lord Mayor of Boston, a fantastic lady called Catalina O'Toole, joined the Netwatch board. She gave us incredible credibility. All of a sudden, MIT, Mass General Hospital, Massport were customers of Netwatch. Uh, ordinary Irish companies could take 25 years to get customers like that. And then it just expanded from there. But the strategy always was to, to move on from direct selling to working with strategic partners. And once we did that, to then look at, at, at mergers and acquisitions and to acquire companies that we believe could, could, could uh, improve our global footprint. So in, in 2018, after 18 months of negotiating and finding and stuff like this, searches, we, we acquired three companies, two in the United States and one in the United Kingdom. I bet you that felt good. It felt good. It felt good from an Irish company's perspective yeah. because all of a sudden we were after making a giant Is it leap. about time to say Carlo? I'm going back to that. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but it's true though, it, it is true, yeah, very good point. But it is true because we, we were after making a giant leap towards that global vision that we always had. But then, but then what happens, right? So you go out and we're after going, uh, that's 18 months ago, almost 16 months ago since the, the acquisition happened. We've had great fun integrating the companies and now we're looking at the next level again. And that's what happens. And, and, you, and that's, a lot of entrepreneurs go that way. You, you, you get to a certain level and then all of a sudden the bar goes up and the bar goes up because it's just not enough anymore because you can see the impact that you've had and you want to create a greater impact around well, the Well, the potential grows with your success, right? So yeah. it's, it, you're, you never hit the ceiling of that. No, and I, I think really successful entrepreneurs are like that. Yeah. They, if I may they say, we, we're, we're as successful as we are, we're never really happy. There's always a new frontier. There's yeah. always something we can do better, and that's just the natural, the, the, the characteristic of the beast. Yeah. And that's why uh, employ, our, uh, Entrepreneurs live in that scary growth zone. That's they where do. they're most comfortable. And that's where the, those risks actually give them a thrill you know, taking another gamble to go to different. But then you start making these gambles based on evidence, you know, which is, yeah. and that's the secret when you get that far. So now you are part of the alumni of Entrepreneur of the Year with mm. EY, um, which is such a rubber stamp in terms of the work that mm. you've done. Um, but it's more than that, isn't it? Oh, it's far more than that. I mean, I think most business owners understand the value of business competitions, right? Because, and there's lots of them out there. I would honestly say that the, the Irish Entrepreneur of the Year is the Cheltenham of uh, Business Awards. We were very, very fortunate that a, a man, a very good entrepreneur by the name of Jerry Kennelly, uh, nominated Netwatch back in 2007. We would you have done it yourself? No. 
we didn't have the confidence to do it because it was so big. Like the, we, we knew that this was the Oscars. We knew it was the Olympics and we didn't think we were ready. And in a conversation with Jerry Kennelly, Jerry said, look, I think you're absolutely certain for it, particularly for the, the, the emerging section. So we didn't know what to expect. But to say that it was a game changer for Netwatch is just an understatement. To say that it was a game changer for me personally in terms of my leadership style and was, is, is, is a complete understatement as well. Because, okay, you have the competition itself, which is fantastic, and you have all the PR about that. But then there's other competitions that have similar PR, right, for their, for their competitions. But what was unique about the, the, the EOI was that you had a bunch of entrepreneurs coming together for the first time with a number of previous finalists, right? And all of a sudden, over, and you're together for three or four days on a CEO retreat. Right? And then all of a sudden, in the early days, everybody's bravado and they're telling all the good stories. But as the week goes on, what I found, right, and I'm sure everybody else finds the same, is that barriers came down, confidence went up in, in terms trust of... Trust was built. Trust was built. And trust is the key word. And, and you will have somebody say, well, you know, we had... Trust broke out, as you'd say trust yourself. Trust broke out. And it does, absolutely. And the reason trust breaks, breaks out is because there's no judgment around the table. If you tell your story, a mistake that we made, here's a problem that we have, nobody's going to turn around you David, you're a clown. Yeah. How could you get yourself into that mess? Somebody else is going to put their hands and say, whoa, I was there last year. Yeah. And this is how we solved it. So that, that network, and, and, and of course, a lot of trade takes place between the, the individual uh, entrepreneurs. And I would say how many companies have you sold Netwatch to I, I, in I the group? Look, I was looking recently, I think it's about 200. <laughs> Between, Excellent. between individuals and between their companies, Excellent. Right, which is huge, right? But as important... That's as, called work in the room, David, you as know a, that. As important as that is, right? As, and it is important, there's no question about it, and very important. But it's the trade of ideas and the trade of, of stories and, and the fact that you can use somebody else as a sounding board, that if I have a problem in it... At which, the right level. At the right level. And, and, and what I've noticed with that, that we, we're, we're a tribe together. We, we really are, right? And, and we cover each other's backs. So what actually happens if I want to reach out to any entrepreneur, no matter how how high up they are in the ranking as we all see them at a national level, they're guaranteed to come back to me within 24 hours. Amazing. It's just the way it is. And I would do likewise for somebody else. And that's just the way it has and it's evolved over time. But it certainly has been a game changer for me personally in terms of my own leadership style, my own thinking. So, so how has it changed your leadership? Because you strike me as somebody who has a natural inclination to lead inclusively. But we all do, right? But then to be able to hear somebody else articulating that, right? I said, my God, it's absolutely right. That's exactly how I felt. Like one of the guys that I benchmark a lot against is Michael Dawson of the Give Voucher Shop. Mm. Now the one for all, right? Love Michael. Magnificent. Such a gorgeous guy. Absolutely magnificent guy, right? And then I was talking about we were trying to achieve in that watch from a culture perspective and a people perspective. He said, that's exactly what we do. And look how successful they were. So to, 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 you're right. We have this sort of innate understanding ourselves, right? But then when it's articulated by talking to somebody else that you trust and has, gone, that has walked that path It's before, like it's surfaced. It's like it's surfaced and you know it's right. And yeah. then you, you can go bald-headed after it. Because not only was your own gut feeling, now you've proof, you have the evidence that's out there that somebody else has done it before. And that makes all the difference. So I'm interested in um, the applications of that within the organisation. So I love the fact that Alice was the receptionist, was she? Alison. Alison was the receptionist, yeah. and she she was the one effectively that changed the model of the whole business. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what sort of um, processes are in place to keep everybody included in this wonderful journey? Well, I think the process we went through, right, when 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 we started really thinking about this. Okay, so we have this culture, we have this passion, we have this energy to do something really big. But let's let's ask our employees what they'd think. Maybe we're reading this wrong, right? So we started off with doing a survey in that watch of all the employees to, to find out what their view was, and they came back with this very high, very, very high net promoter score in terms of we were a great place to work, right? So then we started, uh, and we started looking at the pieces where we were falling short. So we ended up having a series of workshops with, with employees in that watch in very small groups, and I deliberately got a few people that, that they trusted. There were two young ladies who joined the company, right, that everybody trusted, did no baggage in terms of... What, what history was, or... History, right? So listen, we facilitated, I said, what well, need concrete examples back where we as an organisation are falling short, right? Some great stuff came back. And then we addressed those, and then we went back to our employees a second time for a workshop. I said, okay, you decide what type of organisation you want to work it in that Love watch. It. You know, what behaviours do you think should we always follow? Now, there's two things we always do and two things that we never do that are completely and utterly unacceptable. Carved in stone. Correct. For the two things we always do, you have a long life in that watch, you get promoted, you get rewarded. For those that we don't do, 
you have to leave the organisation. And it's policed by the individuals in the organisation, not by me. I'm governed by the exact same rules. And then I think the real secret is that we, we reward people in line with the, with the culture of the organisation. We call it the Watch way. The two things we always do, the two things we never do. So for the two things we always do on a monthly basis, and I started this a long time ago with our, with our managers, it took a while to get it over the line, we had to catch somebody doing something good on a monthly basis. Love it. You have your team of people, just all you have to do is catch one person. Let me know, I will ring them, we'll reward them, and then you, the, the, everybody in the organisation knows what's important. I love your use of words. I'm going to ask my final question, which is, and it's always kind of a tough one, it, to encapsulate in, in, in one little piece, why is Netwatch successful? People. End of. End of. I mean, as I said earlier on, we discovered when you, when you, when, when you get the right people into the organisation, okay, you have to do the back room first and make sure everything is right and strategically position the organisation correctly. But once you get the right people into the organisation, then everything is possible. I want to go and work in Netwatch. <laughs> David, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for You're coming welcome. in. Thanks for listening to Joe's Architects of Business, made proudly in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. Thanks to everybody here at Maximum Studios and, of course, to our fabulous guest, David Walsh of Netwatch. If you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to get a brand new episode into your feed every fortnight for free. I'm Sonia Lennon. Thanks for tuning in.